or to the clip. Good, good. Hi, Edward. Oh, hello, Caroline. So sorry, sorry, I'm on speaker only. Now yeah. I can see. I'm everybody. so sorry. I just was muddling the month I was in. Oh, That's don't worry. I made it. such a total cock up. It's really happens to us all, dear. Don't so worry. Sorry. Don't worry at all. And lovely to see John. Good evening. And Elliot as well. Hi, good evening. Good, good evening. evening. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Right. Very good. Let's wait to see. We'll wait for five five thirty before starting. Okay. Is Peter coming? Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Hamida, how are you? Fine, thank you, and yourself? Very well, thank you. Very pleased to be getting to the end of lockdown. Well, we hope. <laughs> and, and Saudi Arabia is opening up, I see. Alhamdulillah. Yes, alhamdulillah. <laughs> yeah. Trouble is, if you go there, you still have to spend two weeks in a hotel when you come back. So um, my plans are still on hold. <laughs> Hamida, I see you on fa on um, Facebook from time to time. Yeah. Mm, not I. No. <laughs> no. What am I thinking of then? Something else. So last time I saw you was in Jeddah last January. Uh, yes. Not been, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, I'm going mute now. I think I'll do the same. I think it helps. Yeah, the, I, uh, could ask, if you could, I could ask all the those who are not speaking officially, if you could go to mute, that helps. Saves any background noises. Um, Peter, good afternoon. Peter Harrigan. Hello, John. How are you? I'm very well. Good. If there's any errors in what we t will you butt in and say, well, that was quite wrong. Yeah. I, I will, as long as you're, <laughs> oh, you're okay yeah. with that. Yes. I, ne I never take offence. Good. Okay. I'm. I'm. Re I'll be ready and waiting to pounce. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you John. You better ask for my permission, Peter. If I'll... Yes. Okay. I'll put my hand up. Yeah. You. You could do the reaction button. Yeah, exactly. Chat to me. <laughs> right, well, we're at, um, I'll just admit participants as we come in, but uh, 5.30, we shall start. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the latest uh, Zoom meeting of the Saudi British Society. We're very pleased to have um, John McCaslin, the executive chairman of Caslin and partners with us. Uh, John is the uh, is chairman of a international architects and design practice, which has completed a number of key projects in the Middle East and in Saudi Arabia in particular. Uh, and uh, John over the years has come to uh, uh, understand, appreciate and promote uh, Nejdi architecture. And that's what he's going to talk to us about uh, today. Um, I'll just mention that uh, John's practice, uh, architectural practice, was named the World Architect of the Year in 2009, and in 2014 was awarded the Queen's Award for Industry, uh, which is a, a particular honour uh, for, for people who make outstanding contributions to exporting. So we're very pleased to have John uh, and his colleague Elliot Hill with us this evening to talk to us about Nejdi architecture. We had a little debate about whether it's Nejdi architecture or Nejdi architecture. We have decided that you can use both. So um, John will use Nejdi and I'll use Nejd. Um, uh, and I don't want any pedants coming and picking us up on that. Thank you very much. Um, so um, without further ado, John, I'm gonna hand over to you and Elliot to uh, give us a talk on 
uh, Nej Nej architecture, a living tradition. Uh, the talk will last for about 40 minutes and then John and Elliot have very kindly agreed to take any questions. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box and I will see them and pose the questions uh, at the end when, uh, when, when John and uh, Elliot finished with their presentation. John, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, William. Um, yes, I'm going to call it Najd. Makes it easier for me, as we've always probably mistakenly called it Najd, but I blame Peter Harrigan for that. And um, Elliot, my colleague, uh, will be sharing the presentation. Um, I have rather dodgy internet, so if it packs in, Elliot's going to take over. Um, and he knows at least as much, if not more, and brings, of course, a youthful voice to the importance of Najd as a living tradition. So as William said, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes, hopefully no longer. And um, I, I'm just going to start by saying, maybe next slide, um, Elliot, is that, uh, is that I first went to, to uh, Saudi Arabia just 18 months ago. That was the first, first trip I made. And that was um, for a project. And we're, not, we're bound by NDA, so we're not really allowed to say anything about the projects, but they are cultural and and, and of great excitement to us to be involved. And the highlight of that trip actually was, was to see Najd architecture, I have to say, in Aturaif and Derea. And I was greatly taken by, by the architecture, which I have to say I knew very little about before I went. Uh, particularly, not that it reminded me of Scottish buildings or Scottish keep towers, but there was something about the stark and sort of handmade quality of those simple, essentially mud brick structures of all scales that struck me and, and the kind of elemental beauty of them and made me think, well, this isn't, this isn't architecture of the past. It's, it's, it has a timeless living quality. Um, and so this afternoon, uh, I'm going to talk and Elliot's going to, to contribute to, to talk about why we think Najd is a, is a living uh, architecture and it's not an, just an architecture of the past, but we're going to start with some a quick run through some of our other projects internationally because they sort of show we're sort of a wandering a wandering practice and take great delight in picking up projects which probably most people would turn away because they're usually complicated and they don't pay very well but they're of great interest to us next and the first of those effectively is a series of next of schools that we built in in Malawi for the Clinton Foundation um, beginning in 2009, and I hope that the, not these aren't our schools, by the way, they, they, they show something of the transformative power of very simple architecture. I mean, the, the schools as the, that we came across, top left, were overcrowded, obviously, poorly lit, poorly constructed, unsafe, and actually the best spaces were those spaces which were outdoors for the kids. So we were commissioned to, to look at um, for night to build nine schools all north of the long way um, with Arab uh, engineers and next. And for those projects, we effectively decided that we would work within the budgets which had been established, which was $25,000 or, or $10 a square foot, which is very low to build anything. And that we, of course, would look to transform the quality of those schools, not just in terms of um, their architectural quality, but also, of course, in the environmental and lighting and, 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 um, and opportunities. And so on the right is one of the schools we built. It had a split roof, a ventilated roof. It was built of, effectively on site with handmade bricks and local timber. And it included within the schools what we call the sort of space in between, next, which was the you can see on the picture of the left, and it shows how something as simple as that made such a difference. Effectively, we split the classrooms, we added this external classrooms at the end, as, as per the, the slide I showed at the beginning, and the space in between became phenomenally important because mothers of kids who were being taught would look through the barn doors, see their kids being taught, also be taught how to, re to, to read and write, and then at weekends, when the school was closed up, that space would become a kind of health clinic for the local community. And so it was extraordinarily purposeful and, and functional, but also we think something of uh, something very simple and elegant and elemental and um, in its construction. Next. Um, 
in Volubilis, uh, northwest of Fez, we, um, which is one again, one of our slightly unusual projects. This, for those who know Volubilis, it's the furthest south into Africa that the Romans um, penetrated. And, but there's also south of the, the main settlement is a Islamic um, settlement itself, obviously a later Islamic settlement. And that's really what interested me. Um, next, and so we developed a project with the University College London, the University of Meknes, and the Ministry of Culture in Morocco, which looked at um, effectively a project which, which, which uh, I, I guess, excavated and opened that site um, for, for a greater understanding of its form and courtyard housing. There's a man that's being repaired. And that work, which was led by a wonderful archaeologist called um, Elizabeth Fentress, was on today and brings, I think, this, this extraordinary kind of comparison between the Roman and the Islamic, uh, later Islamic settlement. Next. Um, we're also involved in, in significant number of educational projects with students, and this was called the One Year House, which was built by two wonderful um, architectural association students, uh, Julia King and Asif Khan. And we gave them a, a, a little um, bursary award. And with that, they traveled extensively to the Thai-Burmese border and worked with the local community to build these amazing bamboo houses with an adjustable roof, a bit like a, an, an adjustable version of our Malawi schools, and um, passed on those, those skills of, of effectively developing innovative ways of working with um, materials to a wide group of um, of the local. John, could I just interrupt? Yes. Could I ask people who've just joined, put themselves on mute? Could I ask the people who've just joined to put themselves on mute, please? Put yourself on mute, please. Very good. Okay. Some kind of connect internet. Salman, can you put your I'll put them on mute. I thought it might be William. I thought that might be a fight going on, but I thought, well, there can't be a fight in the no, sorry, <laughs> On you go now. I'll put yeah, so, them on mute. So and, and the 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 project ended with Asif and Julia effectively dividing uh, developing a handbook to continue the to, to guide going forward the, the building of these, what they call the one year house. Of course, they lasted significantly more than one year, one years. And, and, you know, I think that shows, you know, for young architects, the fact or to, to people in it to, who are here, that young architects are interested in this stuff. I mean, you know, this is the future of working with local materials and looking at ecological and responsible ways of building. And Asif and Julia typified that enthusiasm and commitment to go far away, far as far afield to develop skills, and then of course to put these in practice uh, wherever they were fortunate enough to work. Next. And then lastly, probably could be a whole series of lectures, I guess, on its own, is the, is the Florida Southern College in Florida. And Florida Southern was one of the last buildings, set of buildings developed by Frank Lloyd Wright, the great American architect who developed effectively his own form of sort of Naj construction, building, effectively developing buildings made of effectively uh, uh, air, uh, concrete blocks, textile blocks in that they were stacked vertically and then connected horizontally and vertically with reinforcement. And uh, this photograph on the left is right on the left with Ludd M. Spivey, who was this extraordinary director of Florida Southern College who befriended Wright and convinced Wright to build a series of buildings, the, 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 Lick, the Lickland campus, which on the right, probably the best known building is the Annie Pfeiffer Chapel. In the middle, this lady who looks to be levitating on the lawn is the, what was called the Polk County Science Building, which was possibly the worst ever design, building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And it's one which we were challenged to repair and restore. Next. The key thing about Florida Southern though, as I said, was that it was it utilized rather crudely made block, uh, concrete blocks. Each were about 
three feet long by a foot high, crumbling, and the buildings around them were crumbling. So we developed with Arab engineers, um, this sort of super strong replacement block and in various formations, which allowed the buildings to be stabilized. Um, and on the right, you can see somebody actually is from Trent Concrete taking um, effectively uh, building prototype elements of blocks, which could then be tested. And I used to haul these over to uh, on Virgin Atlantic Economy to Orlando uh, um, and then take them to the site. And of course, the client thought it was a complete maniac that why was I there and why was I interested in these buildings? But it's because it was extraordinary that one of the great architects in the world, Frank Lloyd Wright, had experimented with this form of construction of handmade buildings um, over an extended period, um, which had failed, but which were still glorious buildings in their own right. And I felt sort of compelled to try and contribute to their repair and reuse. Next. And then, so the building we actually ended up being commissioned for the Paul County Science Building, which was about to be demolished, it wasn't protected. We rebuilt as a science building um, uh, back in, the, in uh, 2005. So that, in a way, sets as a sort of prelude as why we're in, why it's perhaps in our wanderings, we were interested in. Um, the uh, in uh, architecture. And lastly, there is actually one completing project, which is actually probably the closest to Nejd, is a group of museums that we built in Doha, formed within a, a four courtyard houses, constructed in some in, in effectively adobes, others in uh, rubble masonry. Um, next, and they became, you can see the four marked in red, really the only buildings which were retained in the heart of Doha, which became part of a major redevelopment where we were architects for a number of buildings and landscapes. But one of our principal commissions was to save those buildings and to restore as museums. Next. We, we started off in a way, in, in a way that really would be um, equivalent to looking at a Naj building, which was to sort of unpick how the original building was constructed. So this was a typical um, courtyard house, not one of the houses actually that we turned into a museum, but it was the, the house which we effectively took apart and then reconstructed in order that we understood how it was made. This, in this case, it wasn't adobe, it was, it was sort of rubble, it was kind of rubble masonry with, um, with palm tree lintels and, 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 and beams and earth, uh, fired earth roofs, richly decorated doors, but, but you can imagine it was similar, similar in character, albeit much later than Najd architecture, and consisting of all of the sort of challenges which this sort of, sort of hybrid historic um, masonry or adobe constructed buildings consist of. So that was in a way our introduction to comparable building types which we then repaired and next and brought back into use as a series of museums with sort of significant interventions, which in a way, Naj buildings need if they are in, in many cases, so inserting modern services, um, threading those through the existing fabric, um, improving the, the compressive strength of the structure itself. Um, and in this case, introducing various museum functions uh, within the four buildings so they could be used as museums which tells the story of the past, the present and the future of Doha. Next. So, the Naj context. I mean, I, I'm not for a moment going to try and tell people about the subject that, the, that they know much more about, but we, as probably most of you will know, and you'll know a lot more than I do, that Naj forms the geographical centre of, of Saudi Arabia, accounts for about 20% of its area and about 30% of its population, spread across 40 or so cities and 1,200 villages. The region's about 1,000 kilometers long, 750 kilometers wide. It slopes from its highest point to the west down eastward. And it's probably typified, as is illustrated in this photograph, or photographic illustration, of these wonderful valleys, um, wadis that extend through um, 
Najd, Najd and, and in this instance, um, Wadi Hanifa, one of the great um, wadis in, in Central Arabia, which for thousands of years has nurtured oasis communities and uh, through seasonal floods brought fertile soil, silt and mud to its banks, creating essential material for agriculture and building. And crucially, of course, not only does that happen, but it's also climatically one of the most arid regions in all of the world, which suffers long, hot, and totally dry summers with daytime temperatures that can reach 50 degrees centigrade. And when the rain comes, of course, which is typical of, of desert rainfall, it usually results in violent rainstorms where about half of the year's rainfall can occur in a day leading to obviously, in some cases, catastrophic flooding. Next. I'm now going to pass over actually to, to um, Elliot, who's going to talk a bit about um, the specifics of at Turef and um, Derea, and which in a way is the sort of heart of our interest. Um, Elliot, would you like to, yes. if you can talk <clears throat> and control, that would be great. Great, thank you, John. Um, yeah, first I would just like to say, yeah, I think, well, as John sort of rightly pointed out, I think our sort of fascination in Najd architecture came from sort of a various um, array of projects that we sort of were working on in the region. And sort of as John's rightly mentioned, we kind of took a, a deep dive into the origins of sort of the native architecture of, of Najd. And sort of what's shown here, I think, was, you know, essentially our um, sort of first look at sort of understanding the region's architecture and its origin. So that being the, the Atarev World Heritage Site. So sort of what I'll start to do now is essentially go through um, a series of slides that I think sort of started to captivate and um, sort of understand, give us a better understanding of Najd architecture. So the image here was, um, you know, while, while while we were working on the project sort of became our first sort of fascination points, um, sort of purely from its sort of incredible scale and its sort of relationship to the context and its sense of place and organic nature was something we were quite taken by and its sort of tonal qualities and the textual um, openings and um, the, purely the built, the, how organic the built forms are of, of Najd. And I think that kind of sparked our sort of interest and in, in deep dive into, into Najd. Um, so, so sort of from that, we kind of, we, we basically started to explore um, Atarev and, and what's shown here is essentially a, a snippet of, of that area. And as, as shown the sort of varying urban grains and courtyards and footprints and spatial arrangements that essentially make up um, the sort of origins of, of Najd and, and how that comes about. So I think what's sort of shown here is the slightly finer detail to fully understand the from urbanistic point of view. Um, and what was striking from the outset was sort of the sheer organic form. So it, in comparison to say modern urban grids that are, I guess, very much driven by um, sort of contemporary views, this, this is purely driven by its elements and the environments um, surrounding it. So it sort of, it began to, you know, mitigate the issues of the prevailing winds and disrupting the wind flow and the sand um, and, you know, that its inherent harsh nature of, of the region. And I think secondly, what was really striking was how large some of the footprints um, of the blocks became compared to the internal spatial arrangements. And, you know, it, we, we see in um, some sort of modern um, contemporary grids from such as say the Manhattan grid where you've kind of got these mega blocks and they're very dense but what works quite well here with that we thought well we found quite fascinating was that you have these very large footprints but they're, they're, they're thought of very well through these series of courtyards that offer that sort of inward looking secure zone um, for the dwellings that essentially uh, make up those sort of larger footprints 
So going on from there, so further to that, we, we sort of decided to take a, an even closer look at what one of those sort of, I guess, cluster um, blocks um, start to become. So from that, as sort of previously mentioned, there were, there, there were a range of sizes, but predominantly um, around about, say, 1,000 to 2,000 square meters in, in size. And they were sort of broken down into the individual dwellings and separated and connected by these series of courtyards, which are, you know, value, give a huge amount of value for not only the shelter and the sort of the harsh environment around, but they provide that open space and light to the dwellings of, of those larger footprints. And it, it, from this, it, it kind of... Um, started to yeah, really spark an interest of how, you know, modern day blocks of, of um, urban grids and how, you know, a lot of these principles, you know, do, do transfer over and how, you know, the origins of, of way back in, in, in the, you know, the principle of the Naj times was, you know, quite, quite forward thinking. I mean, I think, thanks, if you just go back for a moment, I think the other thing that struck us was that whilst Actoraif had monumental buildings and palaces. It was, this, it was a simple courtyard dwelling and the spaces between and the alleyways, which probably was the most interesting to us. And, and also demonstrated that those very simple, you know, crumbling dwellings were highly <coughs> ecological and providing a natural response to the, to the you know, the specifically ha harsh climatic conditions um, and with thermal and economic and social and other environmental attributes, ensuring that indoor, indoor temperatures were cool in summer and warm in winter. So we seem to think, well, I mean, that's so relevant to what we need to be thinking about today. So in those simple buildings, there were a lot of clues, we felt, I think, to, to a kind of ecologically responsible way of looking at the architecture of the, of the future. Next. And then, and then in all of this is all about mud, you know, mud, mud, glorious mud, you know, one of the oldest materials used in construction, you know, it's a mix of water and, and organic soil, in a way is, the, is at the heart of, of Najd architecture. But that expression of mud bricks, there's many variants of it. There's earth bricks, there's soil bricks, there's cob, there's adobe, there's sun-dried bricks, there's clay bricks, there's stabilized bricks. And there's rammed earth, which is a fantastic material when it's used in its in its mud form, but also in its concrete form as a as a as a stable material. <clears throat> and of course, you take all of that and the, and uh, with the distinctive patterns and colours of of that of that mud-based architecture, and you get a compelling language of buildings of buildings which are both large and small. But those buildings next aren't, of course, just typical of, of um, Saudi Arabia because there's something like a quarter of the world's population live in mud dwellings. Um, and that th those dwellings are spread across the globe in China, across Africa, and across the Americas. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's, a, it's an architectural type which has been found to be, to work for billions and billions of people um, and therefore warrants attention. Next. Um, and then this, this group of slides again, which I'm going to ask Elliot to, to take you through, is just sort of shows when you take all of that and you try to then analyze Najd architecture in, in its sort of most elemental form, we, we, bega we began to kind of categorize those in a way that we felt began to make some sense for us. So Elliot, would you like to go through those? Yes, thank you, John. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, just to touch on that, that point again, it's, I think, yeah, the following slides we essentially um, was from our research that we undertook as part of our projects. And I think it was, it was essentially breaking down those into sort of the key principles of, of what essentially does, does Naj architecture sort of represent. And I think, it will become quite apparent as we go through these. It reveals, you know, th these principles are used not only in the, the region, but also, you know, they're fundamental to, you know, other um, architectures, even such as the earlier project that John showed at the Musherab Museum. So, 
it was it was quite a an eye opening sort of research topic for us. So yeah, the first slide essentially starts to show um, you know the fascinating outcomes of not only the built form but the the wider uh, context, which obviously you know the the wadis and the landscapes that's formed from its natural resources and how that is such an integral part to the development of national architecture. You know we wouldn't have one without the other. The, the, the wadi and the landscape is, is, is really integral to the development of Naj. So it was quite fundamental for us to understand the, the agricultural patterns and the water and how that actually starts to form. And, and, and once again, it is of that very natural organic form, which is it's quite inspiring to see. Secondly to that was really the as we've sort of slightly touched on previously, was the, the urban and built form and how Atarave in particular, um, it's a series of these sort of much larger mega blocks that are then broken down into individual dwellings that are then interconnected by these um, key uh, interwinding, meandering routes that open up into much larger sort of urban rooms as they were where people can gather and be sort of secure away from those prevailing winds and um, the, the sands and the harsh environment that comes alongside that. And then secondly to that was the individual and the collective. So I think as kind of previously mentioned as well, the larger footprint you know, it's, it was then broken down into this sort of collection of, of, of buildings and they were all interwined by those larger courtyards that come off of those from the sort of thousands, 2000 square meter larger footprints. But within that is obviously the much more grandeur buildings that are almost identified for us as the, the individual. So these were the palaces and the much larger um, grander buildings that then made up that footprint as well. So not only did you have the, the footprint being broken down by individual dwellings, but you had the larger footprints being occupied by a sort of one sole uh, individual building, which, you know, get, gives not only the focal point, but sort of an anchoring to the, to the urban realm, which was quite interesting. Elliot, if I can just maybe into yes, John. I think the other thing that it points shows is that if you think of Naj, it's not uh, your, your type of building which is limited to one or two stories. You can see a building on the left and the and the building in the bottom there. I mean, these are six, eight, ten floors, and it's a little like the way you think of timber construction because, of course, now you can build with, you know, in um, hybrid timber structures, twelve, fourteen floors. So. It's not, it's not as if Najd is restricted to low-scale domestic. It's, its opportunities are great, not just as demonstrated here historically, but today at building structures of much greater volume and, and, um, and density. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, yeah, and then, and then, yeah, as further to that was sort of essentially the, the thresholds and courtyards um, and how they essentially made up an integral part to... I guess not not just the success of Najd architecture, but to the way that they allowed the dwellings to almost centralize around secure private spaces and, out, and allowed sort of the, the occupants not to be exposed um, to again the, the elements, but also it extends sort of the importance and the arrival of coming into those spaces through these sort of grander thresholds that you know provided that secure layer, but also gave that sense of, a, of arrival to those urban squares and, and opening up and um, it gives a sense of, of the greater boundary and, and grandeur. And as we can see here as well, is, is sort of the range of scales that the courtyard started to take shape in, in these sort of larger footprints. So you can see here, some buildings had much grander courtyard spaces, not to the scale of much wider sort of and urban squares, but much larger open courtyards, which might have been more towards the individual building with their larger um, courtyards, whereas some you can see had multiple courtyards, sort of hinting at the, the idea that multiple dwellings are located within that zone. So it was quite intriguing to see that 
the courtyard typology had many, many forms within Atarayf and not only here, but in the wider sort of Najd uh, context. And then almost finally, the pre as previously discussed, the development at Tarif was born out of its environment and, and context. So, the, so and essentially, so is the materiality. And as we sort of touched upon that, you know, one, one doesn't work without the other from the landscape and the wadi to Najd. So the importance and the local resources of that became sort of integral uh, to the building. And, and what's quite, um, what we found quite fascinating was sort of this vivid array of, of um, you know, sustainable materials that, you know, as, as of now, we all know that, you know, the importance of, of sustainable architecture is, is an incredibly hot topic, but also, you know, it, it should be something that shouldn't be forgotten. And it was almost, you know, we had, we, they had it right at the, at the very start here with, you know, the use of the, the tamarisk poles from the landscape. And, you know, it's almost this life cycle of, of timelessness of the landscape to the architecture and, and, and one complements the other. And um, yeah, I think as you can see here, like the, even the openings, you know, became quite creative in how they were done. And, you know, the, the paintings to the thresholds and the doors that it was quite, um, you know, it was very fascinating to uncover that, you know, this is the, the materiality and palette of Najd is, is, is vivid and very, very interesting. And then finally, um, as, as that sort of set of principles, um, it, it, it's just worth saying that how important that, you know, the Najd context is, is timeless and it is, as, as we've sort of called the lecture, a living tradition, um, not only sort of for today, but, you know, the future in Riyadh, it has sort of this vivid and, and captivating nature that, you know, it, although it may not be a one-for-one -one replica in, in the construction of, uh, you know, modern day uh, Riyadh, but specific elements that we've kind of just gone through there, you can definitely tell that are you know, present in um, modern contemporary Riyadh. And I think it was quite a, an eye-opener that, you know, these, these key elements are carried forwards. And as this sort of slide says, it, it is a timeless nature. Um, for the region, which which was you know compelling to see. I mean, if you look at Elliot, that slide on the left. I mean, without banging on about the timelessness issue, it's all to us perfect as a piece of composition. You know, the layering of of the construction. That's the four pores, the tall door and the short door, the little penetration midway, the the sort of form and the shape of the building as it slants inward, its proportion. I mean, it's perfect and. You know, that's what we must, I think, always as architects and, and is remind ourselves is that is that the naturalness um, of vernacular architecture, of traditional architecture, is is there to be to be appreciated, understood, and in a way continued um, in this what we call this timeless tradition. Next. So um I'd just like to close with a, with a few slides on, on ex examples of how we think perhaps that tradition is, the li living tradition is progressing um, um, and, and evidence of that next. Um, so here, I mean, that uh, recognizing Najd uh, is, as a living tradition is, is I guess, is, is, is demonstrated in a number of ways and perhaps most directly is the evident connection with the best of Salmani architecture, which, for those who um, you know, who know it, is a is a sort of I guess a unique architectural style or approach reflecting King Salman's um, enlightened leadership uh, from his governorship in in Riyadh and elsewhere, and and represented here on the right with the Al Kindi Palace, which was an uh, Aga Khan award winning uh, project in Riyadh in. 1986, and which presented at its time of construction, in a way, an ideal model and a really important model for looking at how Islamic and Arabic 
societies could be preserved and linked by using um, contemporary ex architectural expression. And then similar to that next is, is uh, Henning Larson's um, very, I think, magnificent and vast foreign affairs in Riyadh, which I think is also large scale and unsensitive expression of Salmani coupled with Larson's um, sort of Nord Nordic simplicity, um, which typifies his, his most distinguished work. So it shows a tradition of Naj doesn't have to, doesn't have to look historic, but it can capture the essence as can Salmani. It's not, it's not a style, it's, a, it's, a, it's an approach to building and responding to climate and responding to issues of, of sense of place, um, climate, um, so I think it's important. I mean, we, we don't like to call it a style because it's it's much, much more, in a way, much more significant than that. Next. And then perhaps sort of going back to looking at the, the repair of those buildings and picking up on some of the experience we had in in um, in Mishera, we we have have sort of carried out some exercises which look at how how might one hypothetically retain, strengthen and extend existing Naj buildings. So we took a sort of invented form of building that could have been found in a ruin, that could have been found in Atturaif and, and, and de demonstrated how new materials and technologies could be um, inserted into those um, historic structures. And, and but I think that what we must recognize in all of this is that in their process of repair and renewal, we shouldn't get too clouded, I think, by the sort of romanticist view of traditional Naj buildings, which, because for all their qualities of naturalness, which is self-evident, Naj dwellings, you know, were dusty, difficult to maintain, subject to pest infestations, and challenging when you look to introduce modern services. But however, with ing ingenuity, remodeled and updated Najd, we believe can address and resolve these inherent difficulties, whilst when articulated, express the ruin in a way that, that shows how new and old architecture can work together. And in a way, this hypothetical section is showing that, you know, by, in, in a way, it's what we try to do in. In Doha, you don't have to, there isn't a sort of disnification of the Naj architecture, it's to honestly express the ruin, we believe, and then um, strengthening it and adding to it and, and giving it a, um, uh, a greatly extended life by its repair and in many cases repurposing. Next. And so sort of in close, in closing, at the heart, as we would say, this is why we show this slide titled Vision 2030, at the heart of, of the kingdom's vision for 2030 is its diversification and development as a vibrant, thriving society. And within this, preserving its natural resources and maintaining long-term sustainability means we believe developing local tra traditions and transforming its environments, which must be central to that ambition. And of course, as part of that, climate change and resource uh, scarcity requires us all to think, not just, not just here, but in, in Saudi Arabia, particularly how radically we need to rethink the way we live and the way we build and the way we consume. And natural building materials, which are locally available, allow us to design energy efficient and low carbon buildings. And in this way, the naturalness of Naj architecture as a living tradition, as a central role to play, we believe, in the kingdom's sustainable future. Thank you. John Elliott, thank you very much for a fascinating, uh, fascinating talk. Now, I'm going to open it up to questions. I've already got one in the chat room. Uh, I'll invite Caroline to uh, un un unmute, us unmute herself. Uh, and ask, ask ask the question, and then I've got uh, Malcolm uh, Malcolm Redding uh, who can uh, ask his question, and then Peter Harrigan. So, if Caroline, you would like to ask I, your question, 
Hi, hello. Um, I thought that was one of the most interesting um, lectures or talks that I've heard on Saudi Arabia and on Riyadh for, well, ever. Thank you very much indeed very for much. doing it. I'm very interested Thank in the you. principles of architecture that you've been talking about. And some of them I remember many years ago when I had a number of architectural friends, people were talking about sustainable buildings and it was really exciting. Thank you very much for talking about Nejdi architecture. My question was, as far as I remember, and I haven't been in the diplomatic quarter for a year or so, but isn't the Iranian embassy built in Nejdi fashion? And does it work? I'm afraid, Caroline, thank you very much for your, for your, for your uh kind comments. I, I'm afraid I can't answer that, but I would imagine in a way that a diplomatic building, there will be a sense of, there will be a requirement to reflect those traditions. And yeah. I think yeah. whether or not it's a good or a bad building is in a way shows to us probably our greatest concerns here, which is that, you know, we've shown the positive side of all of this, but I think the other way of looking at it is to make sure that in I mean, developing Najd and indeed Salmani as a living tradition, mm -hmm. it's what's absolutely key, I think, in our mind is that you is that one has to respect what the essence, essence is of what makes those buildings important, rather than perhaps taking another route, which which is creating buildings which which you know, appear to be Naj or appear to be Salmani, okay. but in fact are just stylistic replications as pastiche. And that's very, very hard because, you know, it's very hard to maintain, is to develop authentic buildings because it's much, it's much, it's a much harder language to work with. It's, it's, it's much easier to, to create buildings which don't, you know, which might look like a Nash building, but effectively are something entirely different. And I think that's one of the great challenges. I mean, it's a challenge we've got, every, we have here in, in, in Britain of developing buildings which don't pretend to be something that they aren't, which are, which if they're going to be reflect traditions that they do it in a way that, that doesn't try to mimic that tradition, um, that, that, that is, it, try, it, it tries to capture the essence of what a historic building is. So I can't specifically answer that question, but I think I'd be I think we will now look at the Iranian, is the Iranian embassy in- The DQ. In I thank you very, yeah, I'm very, yeah, really interested and I'm sure that it's so important to develop the um, traditional uh, Nejdi architecture. Whenever I've stayed in a, an Arab house with a central courtyard, it's actually worked and it's cool and the air's come down. And I'm so glad if you're moving away from the um, Western type of um, architecture where there are windows outside and no internal courtyard. Exactly. So uh, I'm really yeah. delighted. Uh, Caroline, really I'm, well. I'm going to investigate the building and I will send an email to William if he can pass it on and we'll give you um, and, and a view on what we think of it. You, did you yeah. say it was the Iranian mm -hmm. embassy? I did. Rio? Well, we'll, I'll, we'll have to look after this and I'll write to William. All right, thank don't, you. Get, don't get arrested while you're photographing it. Uh, Malcolm, you can ask your question. <laughs> Hello, John. Malcolm, uh, good evening. Uh, thanks very much for a fascinating um, uh, kind of run round. It was, it was very interesting, particularly seeing the early stuff that you, you have led up to. My question is really about um, where do you think uh, this architectural, these architectural principles are applicable in an urban design sense, because um, from what I've understood from what you say, these were mostly designed for smaller settlements and settlements without motor cars, uh, modern infrastructure and uh, the kind of pressures that uh, modern cities have. So have you have you developed any principles which actually allow you to um, impose these the, the, these design principles in a kind of wider sense to, in urban design. Yeah, Malcolm, a fascinating, brilliant question. No, we haven't developed it, but <clears throat> what we have begun to do <clears throat> is look at through a number of projects we've been involved in and a number of projects which I've which I've seen is to try and get a sense of the the how you, it's, it's all really about how you scale up on a project, because if you take, for instance, Mesherov in Doha, 
the Mishareb development, which is the downtown redevelopment of, of the city, is about 35 hectares in area, which is about the size of King's Cross Central as a development. So it's sizable, but it's not vast. It's not, you know, it's, it's a fraction of some, you know, I'm only using these figures and I can't really talk about the project, but it's about probably about a probably about a tenth of the size of the city of London, the Meshareb plan. But the master planning of, of Meshareb um, was very, which, which looks to develop a, an architecture which is based, which sort of is based on a kind of a reinterpretation of Qatari architecture, historic architecture, sets a degree of principles of, of scale, of materiality, of um, a response to, to, to climate and an, an endeavor to, within reason, to make these buildings effectively a mix of commercial and residential and cultural buildings as sustainable as possible. And um, they developed a kind of historic grain for Meshareb, which was built effective, which effectively took forward the, the, the grain of the site that had pre-existed and reworked that grain to, to maintain as much of the, the kind of density of, of, of streets and, and of, of, of sikets or alleyways, introduce public transport connections. And so when you look at the master plan of Meshareb, it has a grain which has look, sort of feels like the historic city. It's got a scale of building and built forms which are sort of comparable, slightly taller. It's got something like 120 different buildings. Um, when if you consider there's 120 buildings at Meshareb, but there are you know, five at Hudson Yards in New York for a comparable site, you can show that that densification and, and, and sort of layering in of, of urban patterning and placemaking in itself creates a sort of um, densified composite which will assist in the development of, of, of a place which will feel, which will have resonance with historic cities. So I think you start with the grain and you start with the patterning and you start with the pu public and public, public mobility intentions. You'd start with, with thinking about sustainability, you think about where, how winds, crosswinds are going to work. Elliot was pointing to that at Atcheref. And if you, when you begin to build up that grain, there is a possibility that you can go down to the smallest of urban blocks like the 2000 square meter blocks that we were looking at there in, in um, uh, multi, multi courtyard houses in, 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 in that terrain. So you can go down and then you can go down to even smaller blocks than that. You, you, but you build with, you know, the, the, the scale and grain doesn't, isn't limited to, to the minute scale of, of Atarev, it can expand. It's just the method of how you, how you, how you, where, where you have different levels of, of density, where you have openness, where you have, where you have parks, where you have different aspects. You know, you can build, you can, like historic cities, you can have areas of great density, you can open up, you can have, you know, you can vary the scale to create real places which I think can work to any, to really, to any scale. Inevitably, it's a mix of, you know, you wouldn't want, you wouldn't imagine it would make much sense to build a city entirely of Najd, but you would, it's, but you can, you know, you, you can build the lang you can build in the language of Najd through the, the approach to the way you develop the scale and grain and footprints of places. Um, and I think we're not promoting that you would build a whole new town of Najd because that wouldn't really make a lot of sense. But what I think we are saying is you retain the best of what you can, you repair and repurpose the best as best as you possibly can, and you demonstrate that these incredibly important, you know, this incredibly important building type has, a, has, a, has an extended life and repurposing to fit new functions, to allow them to be technologically updated, and can then be can then um, can then be can then be retained next to new buildings which share some of that language and which 
in time themselves will be reinforced and repurposed. So it's this sort of acceptance that buildings come and go, but you, you to, cr to create a sense of place, you must hold on to as much as possible of what it pre-exists and importantly learn from what pre-exists. So I know that's a slightly rambling answer to your question, but I do think the, the, the op I mean, and Musharraf I think is a very good example of it. It shows how, if you really take the traditional historic street pattern of, of a place and work with that, authenticity will come forward through it because you'll be building in, you'll be, you'll be responding to what pre-existed and then work with that and allow new and arch new and existing architecture to, to work together and um, allow variety of scale and, and use and, um, and, and therefore create, create a kind of ri richness. Um, so I think it's possible, but you know, as, as indeed is, is happening in uh, um, Derea, I mean, that, that is what's happening there, a mix of retaining and, and new buildings um, sitting side by side. Thank you. Uh, Peter, Thank you. Uh, before I go, turn over to Peter to ask his question, if anybody wants to ask a question, you can either put your hand up in the reactions box or just send me a message on chat. Uh, and we've got a few minutes left uh, after Peter asked his question to ask it. it, it so everyone's got a burning question, which is in there. Peter. Thank you, William. Thank you, Elliot and uh, John. Fascinating and, and uh, interesting connection with your Gattery experience um, at Mishera, because I think you could argue given that the Althani themselves claim their ancestors to be the village of Ashega, north of Riyadh, and the predominant population of Gatteries are from Nejd, that you were in fact or are dealing in Gattar with what we could call predominant Nejdi architecture. But my, my question here is on um, modern techniques and technologies. Um, schools in Riyadh used to close, and of course Saudi Arabian Nejd, used to close after heavy rainfall so the kids could help their families repair the rain damage, water damage to the external walls of the mud buildings. What kind of te techniques and technologies now, John, are available to prevent water damage to mud? Because I've worked in a mud building and I've seen how they melt every time there's rain and, and, and sort of constant uh, um, repairs required during rainy seasons. What, what can you use these days to stop water damage on the external surfaces of mud? Well, I think the first thing that we have to recognize is that there is only so much, there is only so much that we can do to prevent, to, to work with ex any existing building or any existing piece of infrastructure when you're when there is a you know a year's rainfall in the day and that um whether or not that however you think of that as climate change related or not it's there is a limit to what one can reasonably do and of course mud buildings however they're treated however they're finished however their the roofs are drained are particularly subject to that form of erosion so in repair, in a way, I, I, I sort of have to turn back to the, the way that we, and that's why I included the way we repaired the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings in Florida Southern, because they were built in, they were built by, effectively by student, the students earned their tuition, or paid their tuition by building the campus. And they got a little bit, um, I digress him, but they got a little careless. They would sort of put beer in, they would put all sorts of other things in the mix because they didn't enjoy making the campus. But the, the buildings failed because the compressive strength and, and um, composition of the concrete blocks themselves were poor. And what we did was that, and all sorts of techniques had been used over 20, 30 years to repair the buildings, including rendering them and then scoring them to look like authentic right buildings and their render would fall off. So what we decided to do was, and what was really interesting was that, is that when you analyze the structural condition of those buildings, you could take away, Arab did an exercise which they took away, the, the, the engineer, the fact that if you took away all of the blocks entirely and just left 
the textile reinforcement, like a kind of, you know, like a tartan grid of reinforcement, the buildings would have stood up. So the blocks had absolutely no strength, but eventually they would fail. Um, and so, so what we did was we effectively repaired in place with a much stronger mix of block, concrete blocks, which came with its own problems because other blocks around our new super strength blocks began to decay and ours retained. But the principles actually were quite sound, which were that you can effectively create, you can, you can increase the compressive strength of blocks by effectively incorporating add mix, different mixes into the, to, into the mud to effectively strengthen those, strengthen the blocks and to allow them to have a greater opportunity of withstanding those, those devastating um, conditions which are, which otherwise buildings will fail. So that's, it, it is possible, but you have to be prepared to invest significant amount of time and in developing Increased, further accepting that there will be add mixtures. So you're not you're going to have to you're going to have to include in the mix other elements which aren't traditional, which aren't alluvial silt, and that that binding to the composition of the blocks will increase their strength. So it is possible, um, but the question is is that where you know that's why I was saying at the end is let's not be too romantic about Naj as a type of architecture for domestic architecture. I, I, in its ruinous state, because in its ruinous state, it, it, because they didn't, you know, there's all sorts of issues attached to the, to the, the to the conditions and, you know, um, pest infestation, all sorts of things, and and difficulties incorporating servicing and the like. But that doesn't mean to say that you can't work with the fabric. You can't work with what pre-exists, and that's what that diagram was trying to show. Is if you work with, if you strip it back and you take the ruin. Then you can the insertions of of elements that stiffen, and this is what exactly what we did in Doha, of um, incorporating serv services, um, of providing um, uh, external built fabrics which are which are strengthened where they need to be, particularly for water for water runoff and the like. Roofs that are laid to a pitch rather than flat, much greater down pipes than one would normally envisage removing penetra other penetrations from roofs. You, you have to sort of design the problem out and engineer the problem out. Um, so it is absolutely possible. It's just, it, it does take, it, it takes ingenuity and it takes, it takes um, an ability to, to understand what is and isn't, what, what is and is, isn't appropriate to maintain and where you can strengthen and strengthen existing elements of Najd architecture, where of course walls are a meter, a meter and a half thick, and without diluting their original um, authenticity. I mean, that's what we did at Florida and that's what we've, we did at Doha. And we would like nothing more than be able to do what we did with that, the house that we, that we experimented on in Doha, which is effectively to unpick a traditional surviving Naj property and then put it back together strengthened because you can then get prototypical solutions which can then be developed and tested. Elliot? Yeah, I am. Well, what I, do you think? I was, as, a, as a young architect faced with the challenge of <laughs> repairing and strengthening a Naj a Naj building, what, do you, what, what, what have I missed, do you think? I, I, techniques. Yeah, I think, I think I, th I think you covered a, a lot of points there, but I, I would say, yeah, I, I mean, it's obviously a, 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 a large amount of time investment to, to develop and obviously through some of the projects that we, we were actually working on, obviously trying to develop this sort of, um, you know, uh, traditional construction techniques mixed with, with the contemporary, is there, you know, um, it was talked through with the engineers of whether there's um, sort of a development stage of actually trialing different mixtures and adding in different elements of that sort of contemporary nature to still retain obviously that traditional approach but you know is there actually a better mix that could actually um, sort of withstand those sort of rainfalls and I think as John sort of touched upon 
think you know it's inherently always going to have its issues as does sort of any sort of historic architecture but i think you know through through modern um, engineering and architectural techniques then as there probably can be a solution and I, I think we try to work towards a solution on on a few projects that we were working on in 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 Riyadh and you know I, I don't I, I would would never say that it wouldn't be possible I, I think it's just time and resource to develop that further well there's a, there's a challenge for all you building material specialists out there to um, yeah. <laughs> become a new component that's going to retain the traditional nature of Nezhny architecture but make it waterproof there you go I mean, sure. there is one, William. There is one other, just one, without, 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 whilst respecting our NDAs, which we need to do, there is one approach which we began to investigate, which we, which we are fascinated by, which we haven't yet been able to build, and that is, you may think it sounds rather mad, but if we were to, if one was to look at building Naj afresh, you think, well. If we say, well, that's that's you can't build Naj afresh because it's it's historic and it's you know if you build afresh then it's pastiche. Um, so you go to Salmani or an interpretation of Salmani. Well, we think there is a way you can probably build Naj authentically, which is if the if the build if you just imagine this may sound a little bit counterintuitive, but the idea basically the logic is is that you start to build. And you start to build something which is authentic in its construction, which is authentic Najd. And as you build, you adjust what you're building and you knock down a wall and you build another wall. And you adjust and adjust and adjust as you develop the program, as we call it, the brief for the project. So you actually start. And as you, as, as you build, the idea evolves. Um, I mean, it's like an artist in a blank canvas. You know, the artist starts and then the, the, the work erupts. So if you start building and you start, ch you keep changing as you build, and you're not absolutely sure what's going to emerge and you stop and you create a courtyard and then you build and you send and then you strengthen because you've gone beyond the 3.9 grid of a, of a typical Nash plan. You strengthen, you strengthen with, with steel beams and then you might line with a concrete wall to strengthen. But you effectively build up the language of the building, building absolutely authentically as, as the Najd, but strengthening where appropriate. But you allow, in a bit like the section we drew, the building to evolve. So as at the end of it, you've effectively created, which is sort of fast track time. So you imagine, in a way, you start with a building which is almost the ruin at Atturef, but then the ruin is repaired and the ruin is extended and the ruin is strengthened and the ruin is is improved in its technological insertion of services and you end up with something which you know is a sort of fast track 300 year cycle of building which is authentic in part repaired extended repurposed and i'm really fascinated by that because it would at the end of it you might have something quite bizarre but you also might have something which effectively is about as authentic as you can be in taking that traditional method of construction, utilizing the skills and materials that, that craftspeople have worked with for centuries, strengthening where appropriate, um, and then adapting, extending, reinforcing, and adjusting to create the sort of spaces within Naj that otherwise you might not have been able to create. And that, I think, when taking Malcolm's question about authentic architecture, I believe at the end of that, you might end up with being able to build, you know, significant, significant, you could build significant um, buildings which sort of authentically build on Naj traditions, but which you sort of allow to evolve over the the period of construction. So you end with something which is about as authentic as it could possibly be, but effectively has been adjusted during the course of its construction. I don't know if that makes any sense, but you sort of build in redundancy and then adjust. And you, of course, because these, these buildings you can decompose and they, they're all part of a kind of um, circular economy that, that you, you're constantly reusing what you've removed. And I think there's a kind of incredibly interesting way of looking at how you can build authentic Najd 
building sort of building history within it. And we'd love to have an opportunity to do that if MD was mad enough to commission us. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we I'll, I'll, I'll bear it in mind when I come across, <laughs> when I come across somebody in Saudi Arabia saying to me, my goodness, I wish I could have somebody to fix this old building of mine. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll nudge you, but I say, I know just the man. Uh, John, John, we have, we have run out of time. Uh, I, I just want to thank you on behalf of the Saudi British Society, you and thank Elliot, you. for a fascinating talk on, on Nejdi architecture. Uh, I, I, I hope that they, uh, you know, the, the, the Saudis themselves appreciate what they've got and are doing the right things to preserve it and uh, help it evolve because there's a lot of scope to do that uh, as Saudi Arabia seeks to uh, project itself as a, as a place that people want to visit. And I'm sure Absolutely. seeing Nejdi architecture uh, in, in, uh, in, in authentic Nejdi architecture would be a part of its attraction as a, as a tourist resort. So on behalf of the society, thank you, John. Thank, thank you, you. Elliot, for a fascinating thank talk. Thank you. And, th and thank Beautiful. you all for, for joining us and we'll Indeed. be in touch with the next, uh, the next talk. So thank you all. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.